fixed on him the whole time. I just don't want to be the background image of the show, right? There's so many other the, things. You're, you are the deep focus on. thing that everybody actually watches while the foreground like, action's going my on. My arm is tired, middle distance camera shot yep. pointed at me as I like. <laughs> Make weird expressions and drink coffee. Yeah. We well, but we have to put the camera on you because um, we had we have two other people that didn't show up today. Like, uh, for instance, I want to point out that Beth, the Candler graduate, when the subject was holiness, she decided to leave and flee for the western end of the country. Right. Uh, Justin, the Asbury student, went to Asbury to learn more about holiness. Um, but the Mathesco grad, what does it say about the Mathesco grad? I gotta hold it down for my school. There's only five of us down here. <laughs> so, anyway, so we'll pan around the room to show that it's really just not only Caleb. And that there's other people you yep. can focus the camera on. Stuart, we got some. I am guests, present. Get, yeah, present and accounted for. It some guests down there. So anyway, we're we're talking about holiness today, and we had a couple of questions written on the magic board, the magic dry erase board, which I will get a. See, there's John Wesley right there. Um, so we've got the first question that somebody wrote down is, how can we be expected by God to be holy when we are not perfect? And somebody else wrote, is holiness an expectation or an assurance? And then somebody wrote this, um, which we're not really sure what that's all about, but Stuart says that that was not him. I did not write it. It sounds like something I may have said, but I did not so, write it. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll sit back now. So, um, so let's let's talk about that that first question. Um, how can we expect it to be holy when we are not perfect? Anybody want to jump in on that? I oh. think that what we should do. I mean, our body is a temple anyway, and um, we can consume too much of of a good thing, and. Uh, like wine, you know, we drink a lot of alcohol, and uh, I don't even know where I'm going with this. Okay. But I mean, uh, maybe. <laughs> well, maybe let's, let's, talk, let's talk. Let's talk about what 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 holiness. What what are we what are we talking about when we mean when we talk about holiness? And that question co question kind of points to what the whole point is about this issue of of perfection. Um, and I guess I should turn it around to myself, right? Okay. Yes. Am I on camera? Am I on camera? You're on camera. I'm, I'm good on camera? Yeah. Your ear is on camera now. Okay. Is this, am I back on camera? Uh, your other ear is on camera. Okay. I'm, I'm on camera now, right? Okay, good. So when we talk about, when we talk about holiness, we talk about perfection. And in, um, in the Wesleyan tradition, it's, it's this moving, uh, we use the term moving on to perfection, right? So, um, like when we're ordained, like what's the? I'm gonna have Caleb tell us this. What's the question that all Methodist ministers are asked when they are ordained? Do you have debts such as to embarrass your ministry? And that is a true story. And everybody says no, and then everyone laughs because it's not true. So what's the other question you're asked? Will you eat every dessert provided for you by any woman over 50 in your congregation? Another true story, which is why United Methodist ministers tend to suffer from obesity. Stop looking at me. I haven't been ordained, Keith. Why don't you take this one? <laughs> so when, when Caleb is finally ordained, when everybody, like, They'll all have... the elders in the conference decide that he is trustworthy enough, and that he is not kind of crazy. Hey, not and all. Just a simple just, majority. Yeah, it just has to be enough just to I get squeak him through. Fifty-one percent of you. They'll but, ask if I'm journeying on to perfection. Yes, are, and 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 more importantly, they say, "Are you moving on to perfection?" And then the second part of that question is, "Do you expect to get there in this lifetime?" Right. Yeah. And and people have a hard time with that when when um, when you hear that question, I mean, what do you think when, like, if somebody asks, like, are you moving on to perfection, and do you expect to get there? How does that sound to you? I mean, I don't think that, me personally, and based on what I've read in the Bible, I don't think holiness is an objective that's left up to me alone. I feel like Jesus kind of helps out with that as well. That's, um, that's a really good point, and I think you're right. Um, one of the problems that I hear lay people have over and over again, and even people moving on to ministry is that, uh, and in the candidacy process, is that they hear that question and they think that it's kind of an arrogant question, like um, that, like, like you said, it's, um, I'm going to 
because people are getting nervous because I'm putting the camera on it. Um, people think it's an arrogant question because it comes across like it's something that I achieve on my own. Um, but the understanding of that is that no, it's it's it. If you can't answer in the affirmative, the, it can't answer that question in the affirmative. It's kind of saying something about what you understand about the nature of God and the ability of God, and it's it's about your it's it's a standpoint of faith, right? I heard it as a story once, and I don't know if it's true, but you know it goes that there's an older bishop who has a group of people who are going to be or, ordained, and they're all young, recently seminary educated, probably from one of those you know lesser seminaries like Candler or Asbury or what have you from earlier in this discussion. Mm, eh, I don't think so. And he asks him this question, he goes, you know, are you journeying on to perfection? Do you expect to be perfected in this lifetime? And, you know, they have that same trouble. They kind of say yes, but he can hear that it's one of those, like, I'm saying yes because I have to say yes here. You know, mm -hmm. check the iTunes box to listen to my music. Mm -hmm. And he looks at them and he goes, well, if you're not journeying on towards perfection, where are you going? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of crux of it is... If we're not, if that's not our destination, what do we believe our destination is yeah. as Christians? And like, even Wesley's version of perfection is not to never be tempted; it's to be perfected in love, in in this lifetime. And that's that's a good thing. That's what I was going to bring up next. Like when we talk about perfection, I think people think about um, too many times. Like it's you know whether or not I do. What do you mean? Turn, turn the camera around. You're the oh. one talking, not me. It's amazing. He's a ventriloquist. Um, I'm talking the whole time, and his lips aren't moving. So, but it, we talk about we talk about perfection, and people think about this idea of Christian holiness and Christian perfection as like, you know, it's you judge it based on the things you don't do, right? Um, and in the Wesleyan tradition. Perfection is exactly what Caleb said. It's the the question really is: is Are you um, are, when we talk about are you moving on to perfection, what we mean by Christian holiness and Christian perfection or sanctification is the other big word, is do you have the love of God shed abroad in your heart is what John Wesley would say. Um, the love of God shed abroad in your heart and consequently love of neighbor, right? So, um, and that brings it into a, a totally different meaning. It does, when, when we talk about um, Christian holiness, Christian perfection, um, in our context, we don't mean that you're never going to mess up, right? It's, a, you know, it's not like, um, we, we don't define it in negative terms, we define it in a positive term. Is that, does that sound fair? I, I think fair. I mean, this is honestly one of, like, this is one of Wesley's theological points. That he never sat down and wrote, like, John Wesley explains all the theology. Yeah, he was not year. a systematic theologian. Like, he didn't have the time for that. YouTube channel, though. And <laughs> this is one of those ideas. I think it would be interesting if he developed it further. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I don't want to go too far. I'll well, take well, off 51% have... of the clergy in the area. If, <laughs> if, I, if I could say, you were talking about the two questions that all the clergy are asked about. First, are you moving on to perfection? It seems like that... You know, that seems a little more straightforward in my mind. It feels like, generally, like, are you, you know, in my mind, I imagine that as being, like, constantly working, you know, to better yourself, your relation with Christ, and to better, you know, the world. I, now I've seen that question. The second question, though, is the one that kind of gets me, and that's the, do you plan to obtain this in your lifetime? Mm -hmm. That's the one that seems to hold, hold me up, because then it's like, you know, that's the one without, you know, kind of without your explanation, where it's like, well, am I going to say I am going to be perfect in this lifetime, or am I yeah. going to, or am I saying, well, no, I can't be until after he comes back? And th that's the one where it's like that—that's the one that kind of is the initial stopping point for me, yeah. where I have to I have to kind of stop and think about that one. Well, it's not yeah. plan; it's expect. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I could be wrong here, but I know it's not plan. And so I think this gets at the earlier point of there's an aspect of it that's not our work. And so there's the holiness we get sort of from God. And it's maybe this is just how I justify that question in my mind so that I can answer it. But to me, it's like, do I expect that God could work in my life? 
to make me perfect in love in this life. Mm -hmm. And like, yes, I expect God has that power. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have like a date on my calendar where I plan for that to happen. Yeah. And imagine and, today's, the, today's the day. It's like, yeah. And like, it is it is worth it is worth noting too that John like John Wesley never in his lifetime would say I have achieved entire sanctification, which is the other term he would use. But he thought some people had. Oh yeah, yeah. And there was like one person in there was one person in particular, and I can't remember the guy's name, that Wesley said he believed had achieved perfection. Christian perfection, entire sanctification in his lifetime. But even on Wesley's deathbed, people were trying to get John Wesley to say he had reach, reached or achieved entire sanctification, Christian perfection, and Wesley refused. I mean, he refused to because Wesley knew himself. But, you know, I think that's that's one of the important things that it, in, in our, like you were saying, is we have to... Um, when we answer that question in the affirmative, do you achieve to expect to achieve it in this lifetime, it's a statement of hope and faith about who we believe God is and what God's potential is and what Christ's potential is rather than a, a, a statement about what we think our potential is. I think so. if you talk about expectation, you're, the expectation of being holy in the biblical sense, in my opinion, is I don't think God expects me to be holy because if I if he did then we wouldn't need Jesus mm -hmm. so I feel like God wants us to be holy he desires us to be holy he, that's, he desires holiness like mm -hmm. that's what he needs but the expectation of us being holy he already knew that it was a pre preconceived notion that that inevitably was going to happen regardless of anything that we could do mm -hmm. so I think that the expectation of holiness. I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm not saying people. I, I've seen some people in my time that have that really look good on the outside and everything. Mm -hmm. but I'd say he's pretty darn close to, <laughs> to mm -hmm. holiness or whatever. But at the same time, that holiness doesn't. Yeah. I feel it doesn't belong to them. Oh yeah, it belongs to the sanctifier. Yeah, and I and I think yeah, and I think. Yeah. I think the church in general would agree with you, and, and that's yeah. that's was always Wesley's viewpoint. Well, it also belongs to the community. I mean, yeah. This is one of those not to not to be a translation nerd about it, but English doesn't have a plural you other than y'all. Mm -hmm. And despite yeah. my best efforts, you can't convince people to translate the Bible using the word y'all. Many times, when it has a singular you in the Old and New Testament, it really has a plural you in the original language holiness was something that was part of the community mm -hmm. as much or even more I think than it would have been part of an like individualized expectation so the holiness is from God it's something that God's holy people have together <clears throat> and if we make it too individualized it can yeah. become like a nightmare of either well I know I'm not holy or the like I know I'm holy yeah like yeah, and that's what I want now. It's like we have the NIV, <coughs> we have the RSV. I want the SCV, the Southern English version. Yeah, <laughs> y'all be holy as your father's holy. I think that was called the. Uh, what was the what was that Cotton Patch Gospel? Yeah, yeah. But it, it's it's technically more accurate <clears throat> for the plural. Oh yeah, well even the... even like, like French. Um, you know, my son is taking French this semester, and he oh, came home, him. huh? For him. Poor him, um, but he came. He came home and he was going through the. Uh, he had me help him study for a quiz on conjugation of uh, one verb. I can't remember what it was, but he had the the first person plural written in as you all, and I kind of and I chuckled. And he's like, our teacher told us to do that, and I'm like, well, yeah, that's that's consistent. That's actually how it works. Um, so, but going going back to what you said about the idea, and I think we need to talk about this again and again the idea that like yeah it, first of all the, the holiness is also an aspect of living in in this community that we call Christ you know the body of Christ but also in going back to individual holiness uh, it's not an expectation of something we just achieve on our own the the understanding is that the only way you can be holy that you can move on to perfection is if you have the 
presence of the Holy Spirit, and that's that's the way it is achieved. It's, it's without that you can't be. I mean, it's just that doesn't happen. And it's not it's not everything that happens. I mean, it's not like God expected people to be individually holy, mm-hmm. like on their own effort, and then realize that wasn't a thing, and then sent Jesus. You know, the whole system of sacrifices, the priests were all ways to acknowledge that there will be times you are not holy, you are unclean, and then how to come back into holiness, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, it's just a well, very Well, once again, it's the issue of community. Yeah. You know, it's that it, you were you were in the first step, I guess, would be, you think this is safe to say, the first step towards moving on to perfection is acknowledging that you are part of a community. It's not, you're not just the Lone Ranger, that you are in relationship. Yeah, and that's, I mean, honestly, I think that's, if I had to pick out of the many, many ways American Christianity as a corporate whole gets things wrong, one of them is we've over-individualized the whole Mm -hmm. thing into like, well, you hear it in so much modern Christian music, like, me and Jesus, two buddies together, just Jesus and I. It's best gone from, friends, we're totally best Yeah, friends. I mean, it's gone from when we when we all get to heaven, what a mm-hmm. day of rejoicing, to when I stand in his presence. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to say, if I arrive and it's just me and Jesus in heaven, like, it's going to be an awkward moment. Mm-hmm. Not just because I'm a pastor, yeah. I'm going to wonder where my congregants were, but like... Yeah. How bad a job did you do, Kate? Yeah, right? Like, like, well, yeah. I did a great job that all my congregants had gone, but yeah, I'm I think, still here. I think that's going to be the question Jesus would have. What did you do? I feel like at the same time, even though that is very is true, and that I think we do are really too, um, too um, what's the word? Individualized. Individualized or in, yeah, one person or one, yeah. Too much of that. <laughs> I, I feel like... Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, a relationship between me and Christ to achieve holiness mm-hmm. um, is 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 very intimate. And, oh yeah, and it requires intimacy for, at, at times. And I feel like God kind of even He even illustrates that through marriage, or He illustrates that through um, uh, the relationship between uh, David and David's friend. I forgot his name, Jonathan. Jonathan. <laughs> so. Thanks. <laughs> so, I, I feel like, even though um, I feel like, yes, holiness, holiness is for every. It's, it's not just for me. It's for it's for him. It's for you. It's for you. But at the same time, in order to get that, it requires an intimate relationship. With, so I feel like, you know. Well, like, it's it's a it's a kind of a balancing act because it's like. There's an individual component in which we have to, you know, ourselves make the decision to follow Christ or not. But at the same point, it's not, when we do that, it's also not like we are, you know, we are bound only to, you know, for our own selves. Salvation, a kind of the act of salvation then kind of, if you, you know, if you're truly following Christ, then pushes you to the community of Christians and also to serve the community beyond just the, the church walls, metaphorically or physically speaking. So this, it's kind of a both thing. You have your own relationship, but also the, the community relationship, you know, in in the church, in the ch- we'll say the Catholic little C church, and then the where is the big C church, the uh, universal the, church, universal church, yeah, the universal church, and then to the to the world as a whole, church or otherwise. I use the analogy when I try to explain to people like it's like a family. If you have brothers and sisters, your father is each of your fathers. You have your own relationship with your father. Mm-hmm. They're all a little bit different. Yeah. But your relationships are actually intertwined with each other quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And so if one of you is the good sibling and the other is the bad sibling, like the bad sibling's actions can affect your relationship with the father mm-hmm. sometimes. Mm-hmm. The good sibling's actions can, like, yes, you do have that individual relationship with your father, but it gets tied in together. And I think you you have to have a balance. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you don't want to push it too far and we're like, well, my church is pretty good. We're a community, so I'm just going to fly under the radar mm-hmm. and go in with everybody else. Like, mm-hmm. you have to have your individual part and see the way it connects wider. Mm-hmm. 
I think we're kind of at a natural stopping point unless anybody else has got anything they they want to want to contribute to the conversation. Yeah, that was good. You guys good? You happy with that? Yeah, it was really good. You good with that? Was that a good workout? I mean, it was not what I'm used to. <laughs> it was a mental jog. <laughs> it was a mental jog. Workout I'm used to. <laughs> it was a, it was a trot in the park mainly. All right, as <laughs> always, tweet your questions to Joel Osteen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. We'll see you again next week. Uh, the goal in life is to someday be sweet by Joe Orstein.